inputs and, and outputs, and I just want to wrap up uh, this topic. So let me remind you, we have n inputs projecting into m outputs, and we assume that the inputs are Gaussian. Input noise and output noise, and we ask what is the transformation, the linear transformation that uh, uh, optimizes the mutual information between the signal and the output. And uh, maybe I will write down just as a reminder that what we found is that all the optimal solutions are of the form W transpose is equal to some unitary transformation which can be chosen arbitrarily times what we call the principal component solution. So this is one possible way to do it where the unitary transformation is simply the identity matrix, but after you do it, you can mix the outputs, rotate in the output space as you wish. And the WPC solution uh, has a structure regardless of uh, this uh, U matrix. This is what is kept from the input. And this is a very important prediction because it tells us that if, uh, if a sensory encoding si uh, system works according to these principles, it should become completely insensitive to perturbations in the, in the directions which are not part of this first principle of the component. So if you provide an input which is proportional to one of the lower M plus one, M plus two, the end principal component. If you provide that uh, to input, the, the outputs are completely insensitive to that. Okay, so this is a very important prediction. Now, the second thing that we saw is uh, how these alphas depend on the input noise. So what we saw is that when we increase the input noise, of the, the output. So there's a competition of the, the uh, limit 
limited resources on how large you can make the alpha. And if you make one of them large, you will have to reduce the other one larger. You will have to reduce the other one. So what we saw is that with increase of input noise, there's a shift of resources between the encoding of these different modes, uh, different principal components, and the resources shift uh, towards uh, components with large bias. In other words, when there's very little input noise, the optimal encoder uh, allocates most of the resources to, or more resources to the, to the principal components with smaller variants. They are enhanced.
contradictions which are well, might be difficult to test because um, in principle if you just observe one receptive field of one encoding unit it would be difficult to say whether it adheres to this theory or not. Maybe if you know you of the receptive field of all the all the decoding units you would be able to I'm not saying that the theory doesn't make So let's start by talking a little bit about the retina. Um, 
it's important to note that uh, uh, in addition to uh, in addition to uh, the Inhibitory cells, which are generally some recurrent connections, both in this layer and this layer. These cells are called horizontal cells.
that I want to mention just a uh
As I mentioned, uh, I will not discuss what, I will not have time this week to discuss uh, why we should this might look like this special context, but I will probably do uh, uh, an extra lecture, which is just, uh, you can come if you wish, you don't have to, uh, to, to discuss at least a little bit these topics and connect the, uh, the receptive the theory that predicts them uh, and are related to what is called independent component analysis. So the lectures will be both about the, the context of independent component analysis and, about, and leading to, to the prediction of this entity in the context of the visual system in, the, in, the, in V1. Um, maybe I will just mention um, very briefly that uh, <coughs> after we reach V1, there are different pathways uh, of processing in the visual system. And um, it's common to, to, um, to hypothesize or claim that, uh, the, that there are two main streams. Uh, one of them has to do with identification of the content of the image or the object in an image. And this goes from V1 to V2 to V4 to IP. And, so, and if you go and measure the neural dysfunction in, in these different areas, you find that you understand less and less well what the neurons are doing. But you can s one can see that you find neurons that become, that in some sense, Calls more and more abstract features. So in IT, you can find neurons that are connected to a particular shape, but in many different transformations at different scales and different rotations, the same neuron will respond to it. Whereas the neuron that we want respond to the very basic features of the, the, the stimulus. And then there's this other stream, which is claimed to be uh, involved in identification of where things. Okay, what I want to mention next, and to, I want to go back to the retina and to kind of very roughly uh, ask how much information is, uh, is encoded by the retina. So let's, we can do a very, very rough uh, estimate by saying that, um, okay, uh, we know that there are 100 million photoreceptors, that's the input. I want, I want to ask what is it, the amount of information entering. 100 million photoreceptors. Let's imagine that each photoreceptor encodes the, the, the intensity of the light with a resolution which, described, which can be described by 8 bits. What would that be related to physiologically? Like voltage. Voltage and what about the voltage? Or number of spikes. No, okay, so photoreceptors are not spikes, yeah. it's just generally the uh, continuous voltage. So if I would want to somehow relate this to no, the size no, of the no, so voltage size, the range of the voltage that they can generate, but also the size the of the quantum that we're going to look at. Yeah. So, but, 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 so right. But uh, so, yeah. yeah. So the voltage and noise. We know it's the voltage. Um, but you know, we know that uh, um, an image encoded at the level of eight bits already looks quite good to us. So this is probably a reasonable estimate. And then frame rate, let's say about 25 hertz. This is just a very rough. But if we multiply all these numbers, 
what we get is uh, two times ten to the ten bits per second. Why, why is it not the same with the eight bits? Again, I, I did not. I just pointed out what I would look at in order to try to explain. I would look at the range of the voltage that the photon spectrum can generate and what is the amount of noise. And that would tell me what is the resolution. If, it, if the ratio is two hundred fifty-six. Uh, anyway, we get a bit rate at about 10 to the 10 bits per second, and now we can ask um, how many bits per second is the retina sending to the brain? This is much, much, this is a rough estimate and a diffi difficult one to do. It's even much more difficult to estimate uh, how, much bits per, how many bits per second the retina is sending to the brain, but nevertheless, this estimate, uh, these people were brave enough to start to try to, to estimate it, and so I will not go into the details of because you know the, the retina is sending spikes, right? So you, so you have somehow have to convert the spike trace to to understand what is the bridge rate of conveyed by the spike. But this is what they tried to do, and the conclusion that they reached is that it's about ten to the seven. So uh, clearly the uh, the if we believe this number, the retina is reducing by a large a large extent. Pressing the signal, uh, and in fact, um, the, this is, there's a very clear analogy here to what we do uh, in, in the digital encoding of, uh, of images and, uh, and videos. And the same problem is encountered by you know, anyone who wants to store a video in a digital file and send it on the internet. Uh, the number of bits per second is very large. Individually, but um, modern compression methods for video take advantage of the redundancy in the image to compress by a lot uh, the, the number of bits per second by factors which go from 100 to maybe even 1,000. And in fact, the, the principles that govern digital compression of uh, images and videos are very similar to the principles that we discussed in the context of the resume. All right. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is talk a little bit more about uh, visual perception and what the retina, uh, and, and aspects of the visual perception that really have to do with what the retina is doing. And uh, so we go back now to experiments that were done uh, several decades ago. And uh, what you, um, you can see here, this is, so people started to do psychophysical experiments where they take human subjects and, and, and show them the light patterns and the subjects have to identify them. And they get here they need to identify spots. And so there's a back, uniform background and there's a set of spots and the intensity of the uh, uh, spots and the subjects are asked to explain when they observe the spot. Yeah, so so I, I will explain, I, I didn't understand what you said in this plot. So uh, what is plotted? Ah, sorry, you're absolutely right. This is fine. This is not the same. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is this is uh, actually an experiment. Uh, uh, this is not a psychophysical experiment. This is an experiment actually from the retina. And um, what this experiment shows you is that to a large extent, first of all, the, one, the first thing that the retina does is that it takes its input and divides it by the background luminosity, the, the, the average luminosity in the visual scene. So the response, so if you report on a particular gamma, so this is for a gamma, so if you report on a particular gamma, so you ask what is the, the firing rate of the cell as a function of a, a, a spot of luminance which is provided at the so you provide the light with different intensities, and you ask what is the firing rate of the cell. You get these different plots, these the different curves, depending on the background. Okay. So if you if you multiply the background luminance by ten, you will need a test spot which is ten times larger to elicit the same response. Very simple. Very simple scale. Now, why would the retina work like that? Why 
I would reckon at first kind of normalized by the average length. Efficiency. Well, even before efficiency, what is it? These are some aspects of light that really falls on the retina that, that necessitates this kind of process. Now, the extremely large range of uh, strength of, of intensities of inputs of light that fall on our retina. Full daylight versus a dark, or many orders of magnitude. Okay, so the, the, the it's very difficult to generate hardware that will be able to directly deal with, uh, with all of these with the huge dynamic ranges. And the first thing that is done is to somehow normalize. How is it normalized? The most simple way it's normalized is, is but only a very small part of it is the dilation of our pupils. Okay. But beyond that, there are additional aspects of how the retina works that allows us to do this and somehow adapt to the very quickly to the uh, ambient light intensity and then it will go to the ratio between what the each gamma is going to go to the ratio between what we see in this and the ambient light intensity. And, and these plots really serve to show that it's a very simple division. So, so far this sounds very simple but uh, now I want to discuss some more interesting things that happen uh, in the retina. And this is that uh, if we look at the uh, receptive fields of ganglion cells, I mentioned the center surround receptive field and this uh, the derivative, temporal derivative receptive, uh, temporal receptive field. This is true when the high intensity of light is high. Okay, so previously I told you that when the light intensity changing, basically what is happening is that the retina just divides the input by the light intensity. But now I'm going to argue to show you that something else is happening. So when the light intensity is high, you have these receptive fields. But when you go to low light intensity, the you can measure the receptive fields of the cells and they change. So the receptive fields of the change become don't, don't have any more than around structure. They're just Averages the, the light intensity in some area. And it's very true in the temporal domain. Okay. The, the, the cell average the light intensity that it has seen in the, in the past several tens of milliseconds. So we discussed why this might, might be the case. Uh, uh, low light intensity, you know, if you would do something like this, it would very highly amplify the noise. Sorry. First of all, low light intensity. Okay, so now we go back and we, we reach the psychophysics. And so this is this plots are uh, from an experiment that was done uh, by uh, Vanessa Boomer in nineteen sixty seven. And I, I need to explain what they've done. So before you want to understand this plot, what they did is that they showed subjects uh, uh, first of all uh, background background which includes just constant light intensity, okay? And then on top of that, they showed them a grating with some frequency, okay? Sinusoidal grating with some frequency. And they varied the intensity of the grating, and they asked the subjects to, to say at what stage they, they can see, okay? So maybe I write it down in the, on the right wall. Um, 
stimulus for some constant background. Plus a grating. Now, all this is nice, but the ability to detect some weak uh, uh, grating probably has to do also with noise, right? So we, we have to discuss what is, what is happening to noise in these different, uh, in these different uh, uh, light intensities. So the main source in this experiment, the main source of input noise is this, the background, because this is a very weak stimulus. So mainly the retina is bombarded by photons at some constant rate and constant uniform. And this is a small perturbation over this. So the main, again, the main noise comes from this. Now wha what can we say about this noise? So at least when we go to low light, uh, to low light intensity, but actually I think when we discuss input noise, the, the input noise is coming from the fact that the number of photons hitting the uh, photo receptor by on its time is a random process. It's actually random for a very, very fundamental physical reason. Quantum mechanics tells us that it has to be random. So the number of photons that is hitting a photo receptor has a certain mean and it has a certain standard deviation. The standard deviation always goes like the square root of the mean. So the noise, so the standard deviation of I bar is proportional to I bar to the power half. Okay. And so the most basic prediction that uh, uh, that we could have is input noise is what limiting our perception. Input noise to retina is what limiting our perception. We would imagine that the threshold M, how should it scale with I bar?
the subject, the human subjects are most most sensitive to uh, no spatial frequency. Okay, so they can they can detect a spatial frequency with lower M than a, 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 a low spatial frequency with a smaller M than the M that they need for a higher frequency. Now remember, we let the uh, regime low light intensity. The accepted feet look like.
after this division, there's less input noise. Less input noise. So the, the, the grating is really corrupted by less and less input noise. But at some point, it doesn't matter because what is limiting our perception is the amount of information that the retina can transmit to the brain, the amount of information that can the retina be observed. And at that point, okay, you could make the, the signal to noise ratio of the input infinite. Doesn't matter. The retina has a certain limit to what it can do. And, and that's a Now going more into the details, this shift from uh, allocate from sensitivity to low frequency to sensitivity to high frequency, I will argue that it is directly related to the prediction of the theory that we discussed. Uh, the, the shift of allocation of resources from encoding the features with or the components of the, of the stimulus with a high variance what you do with high noise, okay, to encoding of features with lower variance, which is what you do when you have low frequencies. Now, in order to understand this better, we need to understand, one of the things that we need to understand is what is the relationship between discussing things in terms of spatial frequency and the statistics of the visual stimulus. So, what do you think are the In any case, with few parameters, the theory can predict all these 
So I will end with that, and we'll discuss this theory.